a couple answers to a couple of stupid questions from white guys. Oh yeah. <laughs> How do you reconcile your opinion that gender doesn't matter or even exist with your need to invent new genders each day? Why are you so threatened by the idea that gender is a little more complicated than pink booties and blue booties? What does it matter to you if other people don't quite fit into your simplistic definitions? People are complicated. I don't know whoever said gender doesn't matter. From my point of view, it's that it shouldn't define you, and it shouldn't define what is possible for your life. People should get to do that for themselves. Tom briefly mentioned this in What Questions for SJWs Taught Me About YouTube Anti-Feminists, but I feel like I need to bring this up here as it bears repeating. You are conflating multiple types of feminism without researching what you are talking about first. You complain when MGTOW and traditionalists are lumped together, yet you are doing the same sort of thing here. Radical feminism that wishes to abolish gender is not the same school of thought as intersectional feminism, which, despite what you say, does not invent new genders each day, but create new terms to describe various gender expressions that people have. In your version of equality, will white men ever have a voice in society, or will white men always be too privileged to participate in discussion? You know, Tuxedo Mask, I actually find it funny that you're saying that in a YouTube video that's all white men complaining about people they don't like. Are you kidding me with that shit? Well, white men have always had a voice, and will always have a voice. Currently, white men, including me, already have significant and power-influencing voice in society. In the future egalitarian paradise that we don't live in, would white men also have a voice? Yeah. But until that time, the conversation is often helped by deferring to those voices with experiences relevant to the discrimination they face. What makes you think that the power of censorship that you are so desperately trying to establish now will at no point be used against you? Criticism is not censorship. It's like, could you people just learn what words mean? I mean, half the time these people love the dictionary, other times they just, they forget. You seem to be confusing censorship with a code of conduct. Milo Yiannopoulos being banned from Twitter is not censorship. Being asked not to use racial slurs is not censorship. You are free to disagree with the government and hold unpopular opinions, just as others are free to choose not to associate with you. For example, Don Imus used his freedom of speech to make his infamous statement about African-American women's basketball players. He faced no jail time and was not fined or otherwise legally penalized for his statement. However, other people used their freedom of speech to voice their disapproval and his being fired was an expression of freedom of association by his employers. I've yet to see an SJW promote censorship. Yes, we want bigots to be called out and shamed, but in the internet age, that isn't even close to censorship. Also, yes, I myself want to be called out and shamed if I express bad ideas, show bias, or generally say something stupid and wrong. This helps me learn. Why is it that if a woman dresses sexy or even topless in public, you support it, but if a female video game character is dressed sexy, then you want her clothed more modestly. Because the woman chose on her own free will to dress in such a manner, characters in video games designed for a male gaze did not have such a choice. However, there is not a consensus among feminists regarding either issue, as there are different schools of feminism. However, it's still not a good comparison between a fictional character with no free will and a woman who can choose whether or not she wants to dress a certain way. Why is it that if a woman dresses sexy or even topless in public, you support it? But if a female video game character is dressed sexy, then you want her clothed more modestly. But if a female video game character is dressed sexy, then you want her clothed more modestly.
Why is it that if a woman dresses sexy or even topless in public, you support it? But if a female video game character is dressed sexy, then you want her clothed more modestly. I act, uh, first of all, look up the trope, men act, women are. The problem, the problem a lot of feminists have, not necessarily me, but a lot of feminists have, is that while male characters, um, the example I use in my blog is actually like superheroes, like comic book heroes, like male characters, like they're dressed in tight spandex, but they're defined by their actions, um, like male superheroes. Uh, female superheroes, like, they might be defined by their actions, but like their clothing choices are totally aesthetic, not be definitely not their because of their superheroes. The examples I used were like Raven not wearing pants, or Starfire having a bare midriff, or Wonder Woman being dressed in essentially a bathing suit. It's like, that's, it's like, think about how much sense that would make for a, um, for a superhero to wear, like an act, or any action hero, really. Didn't you know? There's this whole in-depth commentary on YouTube about this very issue by Anita Sarkeesian. You should really check it out. Watch the whole thing carefully with comprehension. She's pointed out various forms of female objectification in games, from clothes to roles, while explaining that sexiness or nudity were not the problem per se. You see, the problem with female clothing is in video games isn't that female nudity is inherently bad, but that women are disproportionately portrayed as sexual ob objects or rewards in games, and dressed in impractical ways that men aren't. Any one-sided, stereotype-hugging media is boring. I'm sure you'd agree with that. Unless you didn't get the memo, women also play video games, and men can also be pretty sexy. What is your favorite song to sing really loud when you're confronted with a different point of view? Hey, want to hear the most annoying sound in the world? <laughs> But jokes aside, I will listen to almost anybody if they have an actual criticism and not just a reactionary talking point. Why are you afraid of dissenting opinions? Your continued attempts to silence all opposition either by smearing them publicly or labeling their content as hate speech and having it removed only serves to insulate your bubble even more and maintain your echo chamber. Talk about not being able to look into a flippin' mirror. It also prevents you from taking on new information and hearing different points of view. Different points of view that are sometimes superior to yours. Which tends to happen whenever I talk. Chocolate. It really bothers him that he's not invited to all the SJW chats, isn't it? Clearly he has a fucking voice. Some people just don't want to listen to him and it really bugs him. Okay, now I know you guys are just fucking with us. Even Atheist Rue can't be this lacking in self-awareness. And why is your avatar wearing a t-shirt of itself? Look, I know you guys got together and part of it was that you were going to do a satire of BuzzFeed's questions. And to me, BuzzFeed is clickbait silliness most of the time. So it should be easy to do a satire. But really, you guys have just gotten together and made them look good by comparison. That's a swing and a miss. What is reverse racism? Like, what the actual fuck is it? It's just racism, right? I mean, am I going crazy here? Am I taking crazy pills? I don't know, Tuxedo Mask. It's your lot that uses it. Reverse racism is actually a term that was created by white people to imply systematic racism against the majority. While there can be individual instances of racism against a white person, there is no systematic oppression against white people. That is what we mean when we say there is no racism against white people. A black person saying kill whitey is not the same thing as unarmed black men being killed by white police officers and their actions being excused by society. While it does suck when white people are mistreated for the color of their skin, it is far less common than the reverse. Do any of you people actually remember all the pronouns? You know the list, right? The one with 76 fucking genders. Again, I do not get why this is such a burr in your ass. My third grade English teacher wasn't this focused on pronouns, of all things. 
People used to say thee and thou and thine and all that. And then language changed, like it does. And the universe didn't succumb to heat death. Life moved on. People adjusted. It's a pronoun. It's grammar. Language is here to serve people. It's not the other way around. You get that, right? Why do you feel entitled to control what artists and entertainers are allowed to express? Why do you think your sensibilities should be placed above the sensibilities of actual creators? Nobody is looking to censor anyone. Free speech goes both ways. If you create a movie that offends and shocks people, they are allowed to boycott it. If someone does a performance in blackface, they will rightfully get blasted for it and booed off stage. If you tell a homophobic joke, people have the right to find it unfunny and respond accordingly. Freedom of expression does not mean freedom from consequences. Um, I don't know about you, TJ, but um, I, I'm a creator. I have this channel. I have my blog. I write other things. I am an artist. And I kind of just take criticism with a grain of salt as part of the job. If I think it's if I think it's legitimate, I might just um, take. I might just think. I might think about it. I might consider doing, trying something new. Most of us actually consider that just part of the job. It's like we don't take. It's like most creators don't take criticism that personally. We don't. We're just engaging in the same cultural and artistic criticism that's been done for centuries and that you do every day as well. If we SJWs don't like something. We see some crappy game or movie or article, we say so and say why, just as everyone else does. I absolutely do not feel like I have the right or even the desire to control what artists want to say, do, or express, even if they wanted to do an all-female remake of the Ghostbusters, for instance. Let's just say we have noticed a certain amount of selective outrage. But let's get beyond that and get to the question itself, which is an important one. I don't want to control what artists say and do, or entertainers, or comedians, but I absolutely feel entitled to criticize what they do, and I feel like I have every right to criticize it from any perspective or conceptual framework that I want. And that would be my freedom of speech, dude. Thank you very much. I also think, because let's face it, whose artistic visions get the go-ahead and whose do not is not a question of purely artistic dimensions. And so I can criticize the kinds of decisions that people are making in those areas. If I, as a consumer of products, am not being served by the people who are putting them out, I can certainly say, you know, I would like to see more of a different style here. If I'm a gamer, maybe I don't want to see shooters. Maybe I want to see something else. It's that simple. Maybe I want to see more RPGs. Maybe I don't, you know? I have every right to say, boy, I wish that there were better stories in these games. I wish that there were more interesting characters to play. I wish that games weren't so repetitive from a narrative standpoint. That's not the same thing as telling artists what they can and cannot do, which is not something I would ever do. It's just saying what you think of it. And that is simple freedom. Most of all, I don't think women should be harassed, threatened, or have their families harassed or threatened for having the audacity to criticize a multi-billion dollar industry with words and ideas. If you can't see how that's a violation of other people's freedom of speech, then I don't see what I have to say to you at all about this topic. Clearly, you're only in favor of freedom of speech for your side. And that's not freedom of speech at all. Have you ever considered that using the terms racism and sexism as haphazardly as you do to describe everything under the sun that makes you feel uncomfortable devalues the word to the point that it actually hurts the people who actually suffer from real sexism and real racism? Have you ever fucking thought of that? I find it I find it funny that this video comes from a bunch of white males. It's like because it's like whenever women or talk about sexism or black people, t black people or other people of color talk about race racist things we've faced, or heaven forbid if a queer black woman talks about it, it's like we just get shouted down by people like this. It's like we get told it's not it's 
it's it, we get told it's not racist or it's not sexist. Stop playing the victim. It's like, it's like. So what difference does it make? If, cause, cause when, cause you know, you don't listen anyway. Bigotry has overt and systemic parts. A result of social science is that we know that even the more subtle influences of bigotry can negatively impact people's outcomes, self-esteem, their everyday life. Accurately describing something's effects doesn't devalue it, rather it properly shows the harm that is being caused. In fact, talking only about overt, obvious racial and gender prejudice, but ignoring the systemic aspects is what most devalues these terms. I do not use the terms racism and sexism for everything that makes me uncomfortable, but I do use those terms when I encounter racism and sexism, and I don't apologize for doing that. When it comes to questions like these, my entire ethical standpoint is based in a belief in the dignity and worth of all individuals. There are very few things that are more detrimental to promoting the dignity and worth of individuals than racism and sexism, which should go down as the world's most terrible ideas. So, yeah, I'm gonna call them out. And yes, I've noticed the way that you talk about real racism and real sexism. I've experienced real sexism, and I have witnessed real racism. So, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. I don't know anybody who has experienced these real things who then says, no, don't call out racism and sexism. Don't do that, that would be terrible. No, they say, you go ahead, okay? Call it out, speak about it. Don't just let it go, just don't sweep it under the rug over and over again. I get that when we bring these things up, you guys feel bad. You have talked about your white guilt so much that you would think that the greatest racial problem in the world is white guilt. But guess what, it isn't. Your guilty feelings, however real, that may be to you, and I'm not trying to undermine it or say you're not allowed to feel the way you feel about things, but it's irrelevant to the concerns that people are having in their day-to-day -day life, and nobody should have to live with an unjust society full of inequities to keep you from feeling guilty about it. That is a load of crap. I'm sorry, but you're not entitled to tell women that they can't talk about sexism that affects them. You don't get to tell people of color that it's not okay for them to complain about the racism that they experience. You are certainly not the arbiter of whether or not another person's experience is real or true or legitimate enough. And you're free to say anything you want, anything you like, that's your right. But don't expect me to take it seriously. Don't expect anybody to take it seriously. That's absurd. So. I will say what I need to say. I will call out bad ideas. I will criticize bad ideas. If you say something sexist, I will say, hey, that thing you just said is sexist. If you say something racist, I'm going to say, hey, that thing you said is racist. You'll just have to learn to deal with being criticized. What can I tell you? Have you guys tried drinking this shit? It's great.